Well, here we are. I'm so excited. Baby Huey and I finally get to talk to one of our idols, Gavin Rossdale of Bush. How are you, sir? Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me on. I feel I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good. Good. Thanks. We're going to have some fun today. Like I said, you know, Baby Huey and I bond over a certain amount of bands, and uh, your band is high on that list. We grew up around the same time, and, you know, when 16 Stone came out, it was like, that was a game changer for the two of us. We bond over that album and uh, many too. others of yours. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really was. You know, it came out in the formidable years. Yeah. You know, they talk about like at that age when you're a teenager, those albums that come out, they stick with you forever. And that is most certainly the case. So we're we're geeking out just, just a smidge today. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, a lot to talk about. So... For you guys, I know this Wednesday you're kicking off your tour. It's going to be at the California State Fair in Sacramento. That's going to be awesome. And you kick off, I think, a two-month run of shows with Bush. But also, congrats. It was the end of last year you released Loaded, The Greatest Hits, 1994 through 2023. It's out now. Check it out. Go to Bush's website, bushofficial.com, for all that music, tour dates, streaming, all that stuff. But Gavin, what's it mean for you that to be releasing a music, uh, to release a, a greatest hits album that just covers 30 years of your music career? First of all, you're too young for that. So let's start there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wish. Yeah. Uh, um, it's been wild, you know, because it's just been such a celebration. You know, I hadn't thought about it before. I was always, I'm so obsessed with, um, you know, you just want to keep making things. It's so annoying for people because they sort of hold a record that you that you know you love like sixteen stone. And I'm like a mad person, you know, still trying to like do something that makes you love it more. But you have these records that mean uh certain things to certain people at, at certain times, you know. And uh so when we play these shows, what's amazing is the way that everyone is um connected by separate memories, but like a real depth of feeling, you know, it's like really, it's sort of uplifting. That's the best way, you know, it really is a real part of people's lives. So it's kind of humbling to have, be a part of the soundtrack of people's lives like that. You know, that is. Yeah. That's what I can think of. Let me, let me paint a picture because I want your, your reaction on this. So um, I, I love all the hits and we play all the hits here on uh, our radio station on the bone. Uh, but I'm a big, big fan. One of my favorite songs, not just Bush songs, but one of my favorite songs of all time was Alien. And, uh, and I, I mean, and I revisit that song. It's on every playlist I have and I revisit it and I just get overwhelmed. There's like a tsunami of emotion attached to that song. And this morning I'm getting ready for work. It's four o'clock in the morning and I turn it on and I'm just like, like just weeping. And I thought, how yeah. interesting for a songwriter that I've, you know, never met. You've never met me. You've never met millions of other people that you do that for. You know, you can take me right back to a place in time and feel all of those emotions all over again in the first guitar riff. Like, what does that feel like for you? Um, it's a weird thing to say. Like, the way that I've come to look at it is that um, obviously, you know, it's close relationships, family kind of define who you are and I don't know if this is right or wrong but I was always obsessed about having a legacy like I failed for so long you know I've got so many no's for so long that when I first made 16 Stone like pr prior to coming out I really had the sense when I went back to work because uh, we lost our distribution deal um, that I was like well okay at least you have this legacy it's given your life some kind of meaning to like, leave something of value you know yeah. and um so to have a life where I continually can do songs for people that mean something, uh, it it gives it gives me my it gives my life meaning. Like I go, I'm a songwriter. That's what I did, and just it it it's a really good feeling. It gives life meaning. And I don't mean to sound sort of uh, like I'm obsessed about work, but it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I yeah, but when. But when music is your work and songwriting is your work, it's a totally different beast, in my opinion. I mean, I, th I think it's so interesting because that's your legacy, right? But we talk a lot about the music of our our lives. And if we wrote list, you know, to leave behind, like, here's the fabric of my life in song, that song would be on my list. Um, so I do, I do have a quick question, though. I just want to clarify something. So I've never attached the lyrics to this song to anyone. Any one guy was never worthy of, <laughs> of this song. So I've always just kind of held it for, for myself, which is interesting. Um, what is the song in, in the lyrics of it? What does it mean to you? 
And then there's one specific lyric when you talk about a second blonde child felt like velvet. What what does that mean? Um, if you don't if you don't mind answering. <laughs> Well, um, it's weird. I've been asked that question about that, uh, about second blonde child. That was, um, that was, um, this idea of like, uh, having, a, um, there was a, there was a sort of a time where there was something spoken about, about someone who, um, had, you know, in my own family who hadn't made it as a sort of a, as a growing baby. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it was an imaginary child oh wow wow <laughs> with that and as you're a kid you know especially in, you can't ask so many questions about what was that you just get notions quiet yeah. things spoken about and yeah. you can't ask so yeah. it was an imaginary well it's interesting because it gives that haunting and, I, I, and beautiful do, vibe right thank you i do think that um when you put a lyric out in the world, um, like for me, the trick is, or the, the, uh, my job or work is to sort of try and have everyday experiences that we all go through and then have a different way of saying them. Because there are only sort of a varying number of emotions to have, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, on the spectrum of emotions. And I just love being in tune enough with people that I can say something that they can then connect to their lives because that's the job of a lyric, you know, because, you know, even Bob Dylan, you know, it's, it doesn't matter what he wrote it about. If you listen to uh, any of his songs and you love them, you love them for you and you're how you see them, nothing to do with what he thought. So I've never prescribed the idea of, of nailing a song down. It's about this person. You can't possibly, uh, it, it's all about people identifying with it and making it their own. Beautiful. I love it. Well, I deeply relate to that yeah. as many other songs, but that's the one for me that gets me in the feels every time. And that's the thing, Gavin, for Chas and I, as she mentioned, you know, we've been, I don't know, maybe because now that we're in our forties, we were like been really like retro, you know, just thinking about how cool our lives were in the nineties. Like I've fallen down rabbit holes and watched just old stuff from the nineties on YouTube. And just, I really miss that time period. It, it, I don't know how to describe it, but it's just, it was such a, a, a authentic decade. And I know every decade is identified by just the music, the culture and whatnot. For you, though, what did it mean to be part of one of the biggest bands in the world in the 90s, but having an impact to this day? But in that time period, it was, there there's so many amazing bands from the 90s that came out. So for what did it mean for you to, to have a footprint in that 90s decade? Uh, it, obviously, it's an honor. You know, it's an incredible time, especially for our kind of music, uh, for all of us, all three of us. You know, the kind of music we like. And um, and the, I guess the difference was it was a bit more mainstream, and so it was a bit more across the culture. And now, what we found is that we just live incredibly fragmented lives. And you can join tribes, and that's cool. And you can have a number of different tribes. I have a number of different tribes. I I can check in and out of. You know, um, but it's it's really hard to not eulogize about uh, time gone by and so therefore it kind of it m increases for me the pressure always increases the pressure <laughs> yeah it increases the pressure to um to really live each day my son doesn't like i have to think he doesn't like me <laughs> Sorry, I won't call you right now. Yeah. Very <laughs> okay, okay. really good point. I'm making a really good point. Uh, now, but I think the one difference that does strike me, right, is that while we can eulogize about the 90s and my is incredible, right? It's eulogizing about the past. And we didn't have the kind of dialogue that we do now. We were actually more separated in a funny way. We would never would have had this conversation, for example, that you right. would enjoy interviewing me, but you never would have got to the down to it. And there's something to be said about the way that now so much of culture is about uh, dis dissecting it, discussing it, being open about it. And, and that's, a, that's a new dimension we've ever had. So it's kind of cool to have had that and lived that and now be living that, maybe bring a bit of that back into it. Yeah, <laughs> that's you know, interesting. You know, my point is, is that life keeps progressing. You know, it does keep progressing. Mm -hmm. And it's not like yesterday was better because we have a responsibility to make tomorrow fucking amazing. I mean, 
That's what it is. That's I love what it is. that. It's very easy to romanticize the past, right? When you're living, you're living in the moment and things can be very hard. But when you look back on them and you get retrospective, you can go, oh, you it was so the, wonderful. You, think, you forget all the bad things she did. Exactly. Absolutely. And and rightfully so. <laughs> we want to forget all the bad things we did. Going back to, Gavin, what you just said earlier about uh, the failures that you had. You know, you, you it wasn't like you just jumped in, got in Bush, and off the rocket went. Like, you wow, had some pretty... Nice. I know, the, right? That's the Blinkist version. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I think that's what a lot of people think that don't do their research and their due diligence. Like they think it was just like, oh, it's just easy it, for him. But talk about some of the, the failures along the way and, and how you kept going, like you, that you've really kept pushing through. <laughs> because I have this really weird, weird uh, um, uh, mixture of, 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 of like insecurity and confidence. So, in, in, you know, not enough confidence to to not write songs for the kind of suffering uh, yeah. thing, but a refusal to be told by someone else that I'm not going to be better tomorrow than I am today, you know? Mm-hmm. And and all that happened to me is that I think I just was around in London and um, I was in a couple of bands and, you know, people just didn't, didn't know what I was capable of. And it was weird because I was sort of restrained in those bands. My first band was, and I didn't play, I didn't play music. So I just sang, and then the second band, he wouldn't let me play guitar. And then the first band, the third band, Bush, uh, was the first band I wrote on guitar uh, for. So, it, you know, I, could, I hadn't been myself up to that point. Um, I don't know if that's their fault. It just was unfortunate, bad timing, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah. I can't be bitter about it. I wasn't any good then, you know? Um, <laughs> so that's it. Uh, you hadn't so, developed yet. You hadn't grown into who you were going I, to become yet. No, I had no idea. I just was like in it. Yeah. I was like in the UFC cage, just getting beaten <laughs> up and knocked <laughs> out. Yeah. It was thrown out. And then suddenly I went away, trained up, made a record and came back and like beat everyone up. I love that you're like the Rocky of rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a McGregor. You know, it's Gavin McGregor. So I am a McGregor. I'm a two, true McGregor. There you I, go. See, that's great. Well, I was going to say, Boris Gavin. Stewart. Yeah, Boris well, I'll say, as a, as a kid, teenager, I always thought you were a superhero. And this is a question I've been wanting to ask you for 28 years now. So back in 1996, you know, think about for Chas oh, yeah. and I, MTV was everything for us. We watched everything. You're all over it. I love MTV Spring Break, watching that every year through uh, middle school, high school years. Legendary performance for you back in 1996, MTV Spring Break, Pouring Rain, you by yourself with your guitar. So good. Doing glycerine. So good. I watched it at the time, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I was worried for you. I was like, oh, my God, is Gavin going to electrocute himself? (laughs) So I want to know what was going through your head in that moment, the pouring rain. It turned into a magical, legendary performance. But at the time, like, what was going through your head? And, like, was there any safety concerns, (laughs) any of that? Like, what was going on at that time for you? Um, You know, thank you for bringing that up. It's like um, life often presents um, options, you know, two doors. And, uh, you know, life is always a question of how hungry are you, you know? Like, how much do you really want it? Whatever it is, how much do you want it? And... I just seemed, it seemed, I felt like I was just in a moment, a celestial moment. And I could die, but wow. What a way to go. I was like, I mean, this is commitment. How committed? I used to be, prior to that, when when I was failing and living in my apartment with like five people, having a great time, by the way. Staying up every night. I'd write songs all day. They'd sleep as I was in an apartment with people everywhere. And there was a stage in our lives where we would say um, we were obsessed for, I was obsessed for for a bit with uh, Jim Morrison from The Doors. And, and, uh, you know, it's a Père Lachaise in in Paris where he was tombstone, where he's buried and visit. I read his, uh, uh, you know, poetry, his lyrics. And we used to, and he was nuts, you know, so we used to run everything by the committee of people, my, my, my best friends, who I still have to this day. We'd say, well, what would Jim do? 
<laughs> That's great. And that was the that was the rule we we ran by, you know. And so in that moment, I didn't. It wasn't about. I was just in, in my DNA was what would Jim Jim would do, uh, Jim do. So I uh, just sang on, and it was weird because when I was playing, I it felt like it was a toy guitar because it was, just was drenched. And I was thinking at first when I get electric, I was thinking this can't even be actually corresponding to notes because it just feels like fishing wire. But oh, did, yeah. That was it. And then um, that, that was it. And so I went through the correct door, you know, and um, I've been through loads of the wrong doors, but that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we all? I, I love how you talk about two things. Number one, legacy, because uh, I think about that a lot. I'm, I'm morbid. I'm the resident Morticia here. Um, so I think about legacy a lot, but also like the fight to keep going. Yeah. Uh, I can tell that you're a good daddy, that you're you're instilling that stuff in your your kids. I know balance is hard um, in the rock world, the rock meets dad world. How do you feel like you do in that department? Like what how I is that it's, struggle? It's okay now. It was it was it was it was it's been obviously rough because you feel like a piece of shit for being away or when I've you know, years ago when they're much younger, you know, just the idea when you put them to bed and and in fact, I went away this summer with her. We just came back from being away. I had the most incredible trip of a lifetime. And uh, there was one moment where um, there was a bit where there was a, like a, a sauna, weirdly, in a little cabin by the water where we were staying. So you could go in the heat and then go in the sea. And in one moment, I was I had all my, I went on holiday with everyone, all my sisters, the kids, all my kids. It was in, everyone, right? So they're all swimming. And I was like, I went in the, the, the sauna and um, and then I went down. And as I went down, they all filed past me, single file, like not blanking me, but like not making sure I wasn't thinking of coming, was I? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. right? so I went past them and I went in the sea and I was just swimming. And I looked back at them and they're all young and they all went in there, uh, including the youngest, you know, and, and, and uh, all my kids. And, then, and um, when I came up, I had to swim in the sea and I came up past them. I had this revelation that I'd reached a stage in, in the dad world where my youngest, uh, Apollo's 10, didn't need me to be there. Like I didn't need to, it was better if I wasn't there. I was like, mm. oh, that's liberation. It's like a sort of a, a cord was cut. And I was yeah. like, I'm, I'm obviously needed to be there. I can't like split and go to Monaco for three days. Right. <laughs> so I can go upstairs and like, you know, play guitar. I can go and read a book. I don't have to, I don't have to yeah. be, you know, when you've got young kids and you're near water, you've got to be with them all the time. Um, so that was a weird one. So I think in that regard, they uh, they just left yesterday and then they come out to me in two weeks on tour for two and a half weeks. And I will be away from them in September uh, because they're at school. But I think they totally understand and they're totally cool with it and they totally get it. And it's it's suddenly I feel um, it's the least it, uh, you know difficult it's the, of all time. You know, like it's it's easier now because mm -hmm. they're not so yeah. young. They're young, it's like oh. It's, torture because they're yeah. dependent on you the whole day is about you so that just feels shitty waking up in north dakota and you just miss something else and you miss something else and it's like i'm trying to do it for us i swear it's not just my ego Bit yeah a <laughs> <laughs> little bit of the ego yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to make a living here you know like yeah i think it also time. helps that they're older and you can have those types of conversations and and you can yeah, go yeah, yeah. you know this is what dad does, and they understand. And also, let's be honest, I have an eight-year-old. The older they get, the more distractions they have. They don't care about you being around this much. So there's yeah, that. Thanks, but it's, it, it's not for, you know, they. It, what I find with my boys, and they're all independent enough, and what I really love about it is that they don't want me to go out. I mean, they don't like it if I go out. Yeah. I mean, I obviously do every now and again go out for dinners or whatever like that. But generally, when they're with me, I'm just hovering. I'm just in the area of the house. Yeah. And then someone might hang out with me or not, <laughs> but I'm yeah. just here. You know, and if I say I'm going to go out, there's a, a real problem. When am I coming back? You know, that's so sweet. it's cool. It's, it's a good, it's, it's really good energy. And so that's it. That's the presence of Papa being in the house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gavin, I do want to ask on speaking of uh, a family, uh, I guess your extended music family, uh, Steve Albini, legendary producer, yeah. uh, unfortunately passed away a few months ago. Obviously, produced Razorblade Suitcase. Just your thoughts on him and working with him. Well, and, thank you for yeah. bringing that up. Yeah. 
it's something that I wanted to talk about when I saw Chicago. And today is uh, the hashtag Thank You Steve Albini Day, July 22. So if anyone wants to check out my Instagram, they can get uh, some information from Touch and Go that I've uh, reposted. A couple of videos that I had of Steve, some pictures I have of Steve, of Heather, um, some some couple of shots from Abbey Road when we're making um, raised blade suitcase. So yeah, it's just devastating. And and, and you said that you wept today. Uh, I I saw she put a post about of him and I reposted, um, and I wept today about him. I had a little like just couldn't help it. It just sort of felt good. It's weird because like I guess crying is a, is something when you have no solutions in that moment in time. Just mm -hmm, release, mm -hmm, let me that mm -hmm. out, let it out. Because it's rubbish, because going back to this whole thing, interestingly, about uh, missing your kids, one of the biggest sacrifices you make is you, we, I've missed not only my kids, it's like also my friends. And um, I remember when I got um, uh, divorced, uh, the one person, there's a few people that really reached out to me and were, were unbelievable to me. Um, and one of them was Steve and was said to me, you know, you come to Chicago, you know, this is exactly where you have friends, you know, don't forget where your friends are. And I was like, so blown away. And, um, and then of course, I'm such a workaholic that if I, I didn't, I didn't get there, you know, I just sort of, well, I was kind of wallowing for a time. But every time I go to Chicago, and see him and Heather, uh, every time I they'd try and invite them to the show, they'd come to the show if they could. Uh, I'd visit with them. I, I love his band, Shellac. They're still my favorite band to have ever seen live. Ever, ever, I would see them over uh, anyone, absolutely anyone. I, I would, you know. So I'm a, a massive Shellac fan. They had a, just a new record that uh, just came out, um, and um, uh, Tool Trains, and it's a masterpiece, of course. And it's just, he's like, like with Bowie, gave us Black Star with Shellac. We got this Tool Trains, and what he did for independent music, and the way that he stood up for independent artists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was just unrecognized by, um, you, know, you know, unparalleled by anyone probably. And uh, he was so volatile and crazy, but he was also brilliant, you know, and it, like, hey, he took a lot of that back, you know, he just was so abrasive. I think that he really, he was just, um, they, they probably, you know, he was a, he was, he was a, he was a singular person, although, his mother um, sounds as though she was as is equally as brilliant, and and was just saying something amazing about um, just about you know how amazing Heather is, his wife, because Heather is fantastic, and they were partners for more than half of their lives together, and something to the effect of uh, you know, put thanks for putting on Steve for all these years, you know. <laughs> which is the deepest, sweetest comment, and you suddenly realize, wow, that's so self-deprecating, and that's just, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and that's amazing, and it's an incredible apple. Yeah. Because he was an incredible man on, on so many levels, and so, yeah, thank you for letting me talk about him. That's beautiful, and, and going back to the legacy piece, I mean, obviously he has this musical legacy that's just uh, unmatched, you know, uh, of all the things that he worked on, but, you know, it's beautiful to hear your personal side of, of a relationship with him, because that's a big piece of legacy, too, is those connections that you have with people, and he's alive yeah. as long as you're speaking about him, you know, you keep those people alive with your words like that. I've, I'm, I'm going to be doing uh, Bone Driven, which is a song that I did on Rose Blade Suitcase, um, and I've just been working it up and I was listening to recording quite a bit. And, you know, what was so incredible about Steve was, um, and I really, you know, one intention I had was to take my songs and do a sort of a, a mellow acoustic record of it. I always wanted to do that, me and Chris. We always said, Steve, we should use Steve. Because he's known as this, as, you know, as quite as the king of the underground and quite had made some really abrasive, strong, strong records that, that yeah. you know, are there to be loved, it's super, super hardcore to, um, you know, to super gentle. And the difference between him and everyone else, you know, when I when I was recording those songs, he'd say, um, normally you'd record the songs and you put a guide guitar, guide vocal, guide guitar, then you redo the guitar to the guide vocal and guide voice, then you redo the voice to the now pristine guitar, then you wait for the string section to come in and you maybe order a, a, a nice sandwich. Oh my God, it's King just don't just dumb. Take a second, we need to tax him. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> 
<laughs> you are and, needed. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's real time. Uh, and it's uh, yeah. uh, beautiful thing because Heather loves my kids, so she loves me being a dad. So she'll uh, she she'll love it a bit. Um, but so the thing with Steve, he say, uh, so you, you don't have all those stages, and then you sit in the control room. I'm saying eat your sandwich and yeah. let the string players do the thing, and you go, wow. And it, that's a, that's the standard way of doing it. It's not cutting any corners is standard yeah but so steve was like oh no we're not doing any of that stuff you know you'll you'll play with them you know you have to play with them so it's not that i minded playing with him it's just that i feel such an inferior musician that um that i was thinking what if i fuck up in minute three and <laughs> yeah and you gotta start a five, it. four and a half minutes song you know oh so but i couldn't really say that probably so i was like okay and so we did a couple of songs like that, um, the Straight No Chaser on there. And uh, and it's extraordinary because what he brought out, it's just all the stuff that where Nigel's playing with me and he's exploding and doing weird stuff. Um, it's just these moments and even the, it goes right to the end and even the clang that I make at the end, I was like, it's really clean. You know how easy it is to fuck that up? <laughs> you know, like, so anyway, it was, it was such an experience to record with him. And um, so cool. he made such a beautiful sound record. Uh, that's it, you know, and, and um, you know, we had, a, it was a number one record. So it's certain things they can't take away, you know, like we're his number right. one record, you know, probably Nirvana is his biggest selling record. And, but the Pixie Surfer Rosa is sort of yeah. the, the record that is the kind of game changer for everyone getting into them. Souls, a Swedish band, I love them so much. He recorded them. I signed them to my label, Mad Dog Winston Records. And, um, do you know, Jesus Lizard, I became like best friends with David Yao. Uh, Fugazi were always my favorite band. Uh, it's just, you know, Dwayne Dennison is a ridiculous guitar player. Uh, uh, you, you know what I mean? It's like uh, just uh, David Sims is probably my favorite bass player. Yeah, it just goes on. Yeah. It's all yeah. through Steve. It's all through Steve. So Wow. Created so a whole very, world. A <laughs> whole world. You know, Todd Trainer and Bob Weston, who are the other guys in the shellac, you know. I have, you know, so much respect and love for them, you know. And it's been so hard because... We, we all mourned, uh, you know, Heather is mourning, obviously. Um, and then for them, it's a musical thing of, of not having, of just playing, you know, they're looking forward to going playing shows. So they have a whole different thing, feeling of it, like that was taken from them. Yeah. So it's important going back to us saying, you got to live a life every day and go for it, you know. You gotta go, go for it. it. Yeah. That's right, go that's for, the headline. Go for it to get to Chicago. Get to Chicago. I have to get Do to the Chicago. thing. Do the thing, yeah, while while you can. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna segue into something a little a little silly, but I, I think this will be fun. But it's about living life. It is about living life. You're right. So okay, you're obviously known for your music, and we we love it so much. But we also love your style. You have like this effortless style, this effortless cool thing going on. And right now, I'm trying to help our boy baby Huey over here. We're having what we're calling the summer of Huey. I'm giving him a, a glow up, if you will. So I thought, all right, let's see if we can get some fashion advice um, from Gavin Rossdale to baby Huey, like how to find his signature style. Where does he start? I think um, it's really fun looking at just simple elevated streetwear. You know, you go to somewhere like Grailed, mm -hmm. um, grailed.com, and you, you, you've got a whole treasure trove of inexpensive, cool, like, you know, Japanese stuff and vintage American stuff. And if you go on there, you can sort of see what you, you feel good in. I think is the, the essence of, of style is being comfortable in what you wear. So it's less about what we think probably as much as you got to go, well, you probably help them, right? Yes. But saying, <laughs> yes. Things on there that, that will, you know, you feel flattering in and, you know, I think clothes is about confidence. Like I don't like fashion but I like style, you know, mm. fashion's like confusing, ridiculous, I don't get the whole nonsense of everything like every three months or every nine months. I got, I'm such a magpie, I keep shit and it's wild because now um, uh, my sons work all, uh, they just come into, they just borrow everything, they just come in and I've kept so many, all my best things and they just come in and take everything. And Kings are like, oh, it's brilliant. It's so much fun. That's great. That's so cool. Just well, I, 
Okay. I, I said last night, like, we've been getting him some new shirts, little, new cologne, you yeah. know, doing things like that. Did a hydration mask on the weekend. <laughs> yes, so I'm working my, my skin care as well. So I'm, I'm working on every aspect of it. Yeah. To be as peeling. It's it's a whole new Huey. That's what we're going for. <laughs> uh, but in the best way, it's all about uh, confidence. And you have a, a clothing line, so you know yeah. what you're talking about when it comes to that. Also, real quick, what's the update with your cooking show? Because I love the concept. Like, it's fantastic. Yeah. The two things that bond us the most are music and food, and you're doing both at the same time. Yeah, yeah um, it's, it's imminent. I mean, all that happened is that, like everything, uh, I just had, it's like my music career, you know, like six years of no. And yes. uh, and uh, I've got a yes, but now I'm going on tour, so I will shoot um, September is the plan. That's, you know, that's when I'm free, and so I'm going to shoot in September. Uh, I've done two episodes, so four more episodes, and then it's going to, you know, so my gut is probably the beginning of the year. So okay. Feel okay. Right, but I am literally am doing it. That's it's great. Crazy. That's so exciting. <laughs> we'll be the first to watch. All right. Well, we... and I, it was my idea to call it Rockstar, by the way, but they oh. liked it. But Rockstar Kitchen Chronicles is what it's called. I put the Kitchen Chronicles. I was like, I'm English. You can't, we don't, you can call me that, but I can't call myself that. So <laughs> Welcome weird. to Rockstar like... Kitchen Chronicles. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> yeah, but it's just, they, they, but they like it, you know. But I promise you, Gavin, no one will question that. Like, nobody's going to think, like, oh, he called himself a rock star. Because you are. Like, you, you know, right. so it is what I, it is. It's I, a fact. I mean, yeah, it's, I'll have to get used to it. It's like a, but I appreciate that that bothers <laughs> you, if I'm being honest. <laughs> well, it's a weird, it's a weird it's, I wouldn't be like, hi, if you said to me, hi, what do you do? I would say I'm a musician. I wouldn't say Right, I'm a rock not a rock star. star. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, I, like, it's really weird. It's, it's yeah. really weird. Uh, I know we have limited time. We want to be we want to be respectful of your time, Gavin. So we have one more important question, and I'm going to ask it because I know you're going to give a beautiful answer. Uh, I can tell already. So uh, the movie Almost Famous, uh, it's my favorite movie of all time. And in the last frame of that movie, they ask, what do you love about music? So Gavin Rossdale, what do you love about music? And the pause is part of the answer. <laughs> uh, um, it's power to... Um, to elevate, to heal, and to uh, provide comfort. Mm, absolutely. Amen to that. And that's what Alien gave me this morning at 4 a.m. as I'm getting ready. <laughs> comfort in an overwhelming uh, emotional tsunami. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for all you've yeah. done for the two of us uh, our entire lives. It, this has been a real treasure to chat with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much.